Good afternoon and welcome to our ANA Live featuring Dr. Philip Stieg from the Wild Cornell Brain and Spine Center. We're happy that you could join us today. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Dr. Stieg in just a second. First, I wanna handle a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, you're welcome to type them into the comment section. And once Dr. Stieg is done with his presentation, we'll have a Q&A session to answer as many as we can. Uh, also, this presentation is being recorded and will be housed in the video library on the ANA website. I will type that address into the comment section. That is a, a great resource for information on all things acoustic neuroma. I also want to quickly announce that uh, the, our AN Awareness Week will take place this year from May 9th through the 15th. So keep an eye on our social media pages and on our website for details on how you can get involved in that. So Dr. Philip Stieg is a world-renowned board-certified neurosurgeon with expertise in cerebrovascular disorders, brain tumors, and skull-based surgery. He is also the chairman and founder of the Wild Cornell Medicine, Wild Cornell Brain and Spine Center. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin, his PhD in anatomy and neuroscience from, the Union, from Union University, and his MD from the Medical College of Wisconsin. He trained at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School after completing a fellowship in cell, transplan cell transplantation for restorative neurological function at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Dr. Stieg joined the faculty at the Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Children's Hospital of Boston, of Boston in 1989 after completing his postgraduate training. And then from there, Dr. Stieg, is it true that you went to Wild Cornell? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and if you want to tell us a little bit about what you um, do there, and I know that you are the um, head of the Brain and Spine Center. So what I particularly do is I'm the chairman of the department and uh, uh, have multiple roles in terms of, of overseeing quality and resident education and growth of the program and all of the subspecialties involving neurological surgery in addition to what I do uh, regarding vestibular schwannomas. Great. Well, we are very happy to have you here today. I'm so uh, grateful that you could join us and very um, <clears throat> thankful and interested to hear what you have to say. So if you wanna go ahead and begin your presentation, we can, we can get started and then we'll go into a Q&A after that. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. The one thing that I didn't mention for people that are interested in how the brain works, I have a podcast that is on. <clears throat> you can get it on Apple, iTunes, or and on Facebook. It's called This Is Your Brain. And I regularly interview individuals that are world thought leaders on particular brain function. Uh, many of you may find that interesting. In regard to this talk today, I was asked to not focus on broad overviews because it was described to me that many of you, the listeners, understood the basics. So I, I uh, didn't wanna then go through the basics, but I focused on what treatment works best for you if you do have a vis vestibular schwannoma or if somebody in your family does, how can you talk with them about that? The first point that has to be made is that this is not a cancer. It is not a disease that is going to take your life. <clears throat> that being said, one has to make their decisions about how to treat these lesions on the basis of quality of life. And that's where you need to really have an in-depth conversation with your uh, neurosurgeon in regard to the management of these lesions. So what do I mean about, by that? And this is where I really try to educate patients, particularly on my podcast, about how to be a patient. You know, it's when you go and buy an automobile or when you go and buy something, uh, you, you usually do a lot of research, so you come in prepared. And these are the four questions that you really need to uh, dive into with your, with your doctor. What do I have? Meaning, what is it? You know, histologically, pathologically. Then what does it mean to have it? Is it going to grow fast? Is it going to go slow? What kind of symptoms am I going to have with it? Can it be malignant? Might it not be? 
And then finally, what can you do about it? What are the things? And you know, so how are you going to get it evaluated? What are the treatment options? And that is linked to number four, what are the risks? Okay, so basically when I talk with an individual about this, I might I start from non-invasive observation, what it means to do that. Then I move up to radio surgery, what it means to do that. Then I go to surgical intervention and there are various surgical approaches towards these lesions. And I try to go through all of that. And particularly for people that have bilateral or neurofibromatosis type two, there are other chemotherapeutic agents like Avastin that we can talk about. But you have to go through each one of these in a careful, meticulous way so that you can make a rational decision about what, what is best for you. And I just wanted to remind everybody of what the anatomy is. And so if you go in behind your <clears throat> right ear, so you're looking laterally down into behind your right ear, you can see down here is the ninth, 10th and 11th cranial nerves, all right? Uh, uh, and this is the seventh and eighth nerve. Uh, and the fifth nerve is down here. And this is the third nerve going up here. This is another cartoon. This is 9, 10, and 11 going into what's called the internal jugular foramen. This is the seventh and eighth nerve going into the internal auditory canal. This is the fifth nerve here uh, uh, going into the uh, Meckel's cave. So the tumors that we're talking about are tumors that are in this region. And we won't get into, as I said, the histopathology unless you have some questions about that. But I specifically wanted to talk about what are the uh, treatment options. And as I said, this is all about the quality of life. And when we look back at a large component of the literature, really there isn't a significant difference in the baseline uh, uh, in terms of quality of life when we compare radio surgery, fractionated uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, or surgical uh, intervention when it comes to hearing domain scores, okay? There are differences in terms of control of the tumor based on size, uh, and also then the associated risk of injury to the seventh nerve, which as you know, as the tumor gets larger, there's an increased risk for injury to the seventh nerve. So what I wanted to do is focus on and go through several cases and break it down into certain categories so that you can then think, depending upon which category you fall into, how you might want to take care of something. So this is a 54-year-old school teacher who had the acute onset of tinnitus and hearing loss in her right ear. Her hearing exam uh, showed that there was sight loss, but the reality of it is, is she could hear finger rub and she could use a cell phone. <clears throat> Eventually, she got an MRI scan, and you can see here on the right-hand side that she has a tumor that goes, it's completely within the internal auditory canal. There's the Coos classification of vestibular schwannomas. So this would be a type one Coos that's completely contained. And what we're looking for in these lesions is number one, that it doesn't go into what's called the cerebellopontine angle out here. And then how far laterally the tumor goes. Does it come out? And you can see what's called the semicircular canals here. And then the cochlea, which is out here. If the tumor goes all the way laterally, <clears throat> that has implications for both radio surgery and for uh, surgical excision. So let's talk about what the treatment options are. Observing this, we know that the tumor grows on an average, if we look at a large patient population, it's not linear, but these tumors grow one to two millimeters per year. This tumor here measures about 10 millimeters in size. <clears throat> so one of the options is to say, all right, taking care of a 12 millimeter tumor isn't that much more difficult than a 10 millimeter tumor. So I want to watch it for a while. What's the advantage to that is you've avoided surgery. The disadvantage to that is if tinnitus is a great problem for you, you've not done anything about managing it. And during that time period of watching it, you could have progressive hearing loss. And we'll get into the importance of that when we think about interventions. 
So the upside to avoiding surgery is avoiding it and any potential complications. But in my mind, in competent hands, this should be a very straightforward sur surgical procedure. <clears throat> the next option in terms of going up the invasive tree would be something called stereotactic radiosurgery, where we radiate this lesion. And that has changed in recent years. We used to do it in single doses. Now we will do it in what's called hypofractionated doses, meaning that we do three doses uh, over three days in a row. The advantage to that is, again, that it's non-invasive and it's done in three days. You can actually work on the days that you're going in and getting radiated. The other advantage to it is that with a tumor of this size being completely within the canal, we would tell you that there's a, a 90 to 95% chance of control. So by control, it means that your tinnitus probably won't change, but because the tumor does go out near the cochlea, over five years, there's probably a good chance that you will lose hearing in only in that ear. The other ear will be normal. And one can imagine the implications of that, which is when you're in a noisy room, it's very difficult to hear directionality. Uh, if you're a stereophile, it's hard to appreciate uh, uh, where, where the music is coming from. So one has to ask themselves how important stereophonic hearing is to them. <clears throat> Radio surgery is not very effective at treating tinnitus. So we don't offer that therapy if that is the characteristic that is really driving somebody uh, over the edge. So the final option is we could do uh, surgical uh, excision of this. And given the fact that she has intact hearing, the goal for, 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 uh, for surgery would be hearing preservation. There are two hearing preservation surgical procedures. There's one through the middle cranial fossa, where we make an incision over the right ear. We slide under the, under the temporal lobe, which you can see right here, and we drill out the bony canal uh, the bony portion of the uh, internal auditory canal, identify the tumor and dissect it off the, uh, uh, off the nerves. And uh, this actually has a, 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 a good potential for hearing preservation uh, because this, this image isn't showing it, but she did have a little fluid lateral to where the tumor is, meaning that the tumor didn't go all the way out to the uh, cochlea. <clears throat> The, uh, the approach that we took was what's called the retrosigmoid approach, which is a linear or a lazy S incision right behind the right ear, make a little bony window, and then we slide into what's called the cerebellopontine angle, then drill out the bone right here on the ear canal, and we excise the tumor. Uh, uh, and, and that's the pathway that we took on this. And you can see here that we were able to get a, this is the post-operative MRI scan. We were able to get a gross total excision here you very see, clearly see the cochlea and back here the semicircular canals. And she had hearing preservation in this operation. So <clears throat> post-operatively, we still follow these on an annualized basis for up to five years. And then after five years, we spread the follow-up out. Uh, uh, let me make a comment about tinnitus. In patients that you know, normally if a patient is deaf in the ear, with surgery, we state that there's a good 70 to 80% chance that we're going to get rid of the tinnitus. If the patient has hearing intact, we're not as effective at getting rid of the tinnitus with surgical excision. So that can't and should not be used as an advantage to surgery over radio surgery if that's the goal in a patient with intact hearing. So this is the next example was a 20-year-old uh, young man who noted left-sided hearing, uh, and he could not use the cell. Uh, he could not use the cell phone. So, so from our perspective, that means that the individual doesn't really have functional hearing. All they have on that side is directionality, but they can't use it for speech discrimination. They can't use it for a cell phone. Uh, they don't really appreciate the music coming into their ear, but they certainly tell what side it's coming from. And, you know, it can still even be a challenge when you're in a noisy location like a restaurant or a bar to discern where the noise is coming from. But you can 
see here that this is what we were dealing with. Okay, so this is a large three and a half centimeter tumor that's going all the way out into the ear canal. So let's go through the, uh, the options here. Again, this is a 20 year old patient and age is an important factor in the decision process. For that first lesion that I showed you, if that was an 85 year old patient, we probably would have said, let's keep an eye on it. If there's growth, you know, uh, I, I, there I would probably recommend radio surgery, but at 52, I recommended surgical excision. Here you have a 20 year old patient. This is far too large for radiation. So, you know, going through the, 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 the treatment tree, this is too big to watch in a 20 year old. It's too big for radiation. So now we're talking about uh, surgical excision. <clears throat> he already has lost uh, hearing function. So the goal of surgery here is preserving facial nerve function. That's the real goal. And that was basically the barrier that this patient put on our treatment goal. He said, at all costs, you cannot injure my face. I, you know, right now at 20 years old, I don't want the ha that to happen to me. So there, again, are two surgical procedures that one could take, well, actually three, but we rarely use the third. So one is the retrosigmoid approach where we came in like last time and we take out as much tumor as possible. The other one is translabyrinthine. And as you know, with the translabyrinthine approach, you will lose hearing for sure on that side. But again, given the size of this tumor, and the lateral location of it to make any progress with this, you know, we have to tell the patient that they are going to lose, <clears throat> they are going to lose hearing on that side. Again, <clears throat> uh, 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 the trans labyrinthine approach, the one thing uh, that's nice about it is there's a little bit less manipulation of the cerebellar hemispheres. The downside to it from my perspective is that it takes a considerable amount of time to drill out this mastoid bone here so instead of resecting the tumor by nine o'clock in the morning, you're starting to resect the tumor at, at 12 noon or one o'clock. So I, I, my personal preference is a retro sigmoid approach. And that's the approach that we took. Again, with the, with the confines that the patient and his family put on us that we had to preserve facial nerve function at all costs. And that's what we did. Uh, here's another example of a coronal view. Uh, the previous is what's called an axial view, where you're slicing through the head from the base of the skull to the top. The coronal view is where you're slicing from the eyes back towards the back of the head. And again, you can see the, the large tumor pushing on the, on the brainstem. So this is a Coos type four tumor, and it goes all the way out to the uh, cochlea and the semicircular canals. And this was the degree of excision that we were able to get because at this point, the seventh nerve became very thin. And every time we started trying to manipulate the tumor off, uh, 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 we, we, we had in our, with our intraoperative monitoring, uh, we then had uh, firing in the, in the seventh nerve. So what does one do in this scenario? You can follow it or you can upfront treat this then. And this is where you'd use combined therapies treated up front with stereotactic radiosurgery and with something of this size, uh, you might use two isocenters. Uh, and, and this has gone over with the radiation oncologist, the radiation physicist, and the neurosurgeon that does stereotactic radiosurgery. And, and with that, uh, uh, we can uh, promise about an 86% control rate uh, for tumors of this size. Now, the risk of injury to the seventh nerve with radiation is only about 1%. At the end of the operation, uh, the patient had, had lost his hearing, so that isn't a concern. The goal here, again, is quality of life uh, and, and control of uh, future, future growth. The final case that I wanted to go through is slightly different, and this is um, you know, the cartoon demonstrating you know, tumor within the, uh, uh, within the canal. This is the seventh nerve. This is the eighth nerve, vestibular cochlear nerve of the tumor. And here you can see that the tumor is going into the ear canal, but it also extends into the uh, cerebellopontine angle. So again, one has to think about what is the age of this patient? And then what are the goals? 
<clears throat> if this is a 75 or 80 year old patient and they've come in with tinnitus that's not bothering them and a little bit of hearing loss, I would recommend that we continue to observe this and see what the growth rate might be. Again, this measures maybe about 12 millimeters this way and about you know, 10 millimeters that way. It's not a huge tumor. <clears throat> if it grew two millimeters, then we know that it's, it, it, it's in a growth pattern and our hand might be forced. Uh, and again, treating something that's only two millimeters bigger with either surgery or radio surgery is not significantly different. <clears throat> If hearing is intact uh, uh, at the time and hearing preservation is a goal, you cannot, you wouldn't take a middle cranial fossa approach to this because the tumor is extending into the ear, into the cerebellar pontine angle. So this one, you would definitely take a retrosigmoid approach uh, uh, behind the ear and go to get the uh, entire tumor out with with. The uh, potential for hearing preservation. As I said, a translabyrinthine approach would make the assumption that the patient doesn't care about hearing. In addition to that, you could try radiation. But as I said, with radiation, uh, you know, when you look across the board over five years, uh, there's significant hearing loss on that side. So again, that's got to be the uh, what's important to the patient in terms of the quality of their life. And I spend most of my time not really going through the, the intimate details or intricate details of the surgical approach, but rather really trying to understand what the patient and their family's goals are in relationship to what the tumor is. <clears throat> uh, uh, let me just briefly talk about you know, this, the, 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 the radio surgical process is easy. You come in, you get radiated. It can be done either with gamma knife, proton beam, or linear accelerator. We like to use frameless radio surgery so you don't have, have to have bolts put into your head on a regular basis. Uh, the protons aren't of any particular advantage for vestibular schwannomas. I know there's considerable marketing going on for that, but there isn't uh, a, a specific advantage unless there's maybe a little bit of distance uh, between the tumor and the uh, and the cochlear and the cochlea, and you're trying to get that sharp drop off of the radiation. That would be one area where you can have a reasonable conversation about the advantages of proton beam therapy. <clears throat> With surgery, you're in the hospital usually uh, one night in the intensive care unit, two to three days in the hospital, and you go home. Sutures are removed for six weeks. We ask patients not to do a lot of aggressive lifting. Uh, bending and twisting so that we don't develop one of the potential problems of a cerebral spinal fluid leak. Again, the complexity of the surgery, which is difficult to get into in a talk, in, uh, in a talk this brief. Uh, however, the complexity is directly related to the overall size of the tumor. Obviously, taking out this one or the one in the first example is considerably more straightforward than taking out that large three to four centimeter tumor. <clears throat> and, and those uh, issues need to be discussed with the patient. So with that, uh, I would like to say thank you. And uh, uh, one of my fellows who helped me put all of this together uh, uh, is recognized here and uh, open the floor to any questions that you might have. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Steve. We do have quite a few questions. so. Um... Um, let's go ahead and start with, uh, you, you talked about radiation a little bit for um, one of the tumors that you discussed, and um, we had a question about the side effects and what to expect after um, receiving radiation. Right. So uh, uh, with the new dosing uh, that, that the, we're using for stereotactic radio surgery, the things that we worry about are injury to the seventh nerve, injury to the eighth nerve or hearing, and then the, the general term that, that we see with, with uh, radiation is radiation necrosis. For tumors that are ideally treated with radio surgery, radiation necrosis is a very low risk. It, it, it's not a very common problem. Mm -hmm. As I said, with, with radiation, if the tumor is uh, abutting the cochlea uh, or close in any way, the likelihood of, of progressive hearing loss over time uh, is, is quite high. 
<clears throat> the risk of facial nerve injury with radiation is you know, only in the 1% category. My great concern about radiation sometimes is uh, a patient that, that meets a surgeon that doesn't do a lot of open surgery for vestibular schwannomas, but they have access to you know, a radiation oncologist and for you know, like that larger tumor that I showed, they might still recommend radiation. And you know, I feel somewhat badly when that patient comes to me post-radiation with continued growth, because you need to understand with radiation, it's a volume-based business. And by that, I mean, we give pretty much the same dose of radiation, whether the tumor is you know, this big versus it's this big. So obviously it's gonna be, <coughs> excuse me, more effective if you're treating a small tumor. And as you get larger, as you get into that two to 2.5 centimeter category, the efficacy of radiation <coughs> is diminished. Okay. Um, Dr. Stieg, if you would go ahead and stop the screen and then that way people will be able to see you as you speak. And I know that that's helpful for- um, There we for, go. Um, and that would be good. Um, you mentioned the size of uh, the tumor when you were talking about that large tumor and that it was too big for radiation. How do you determine that? What size um, do you determine surgery versus radiation? <clears throat> well, I mean, I have to be fair, there's considerable debate and people that do a lot of radio surgery, uh, uh, you know, like to, uh, they will treat larger tumors. I think the standard is somewhere in that two to 2.5 centimeter range. Mm -hmm. Once it gets above that, <clears throat> the efficacy of the radiation really diminishes. And, it, you know, what that does, if the radiation fails, you can try another round of radiation. But if that fails, the problem that it then presents is it changes the <clears throat> surgical goals because now you're treating something that's been radiated, which is kind of stuck, sticky. So what we're doing then, if the tumor continues to grow, <clears throat> is we're going into reduced tumor mass. Mm -hmm. So typically what we'll recommend here at Wild Cornell is if somebody has continued growth <clears throat> despite an initial round of radiation is we would recommend going in and debulking the tumor and then doing the radiation because as I said, it's a smaller tumor mass <clears throat> and it might be more effective then. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions about surgery. We have two patients actually that are talking. Uh, one is having... Um, I guess, repetitive CSF leaks following surgery and is wondering why that's happening. Um, mm. and another is talking about um, a continued buildup of fluid in the skull around mm. the surgical site and base of the skull and wondering if that's normal um, and if it'll yeah. be reabsorbed over time. So those are kind of two different things, but yeah. is there a reason why a patient might continue <coughs> CSF leaks after surgery? Um, you know, the risk, uh, the, the risk of a cerebral spinal fluid leak, which is what usually CSF rhinorrhea, mm -hmm. or it comes out the nose, can be as high as 10%. <clears throat> and why does that occur? Uh, there's two reasons. Number one, the mastoid bone when we're doing the craniotomy or the translabyrinthine approach is incredibly aerated and it didn't get... <clears throat> waxed aggressively enough, or when you're drilling out the internal auditory canal, it can be very aerated and you didn't get enough wax in there. In addition, in the internal auditory canal, we put a little bit of muscle and we use some tissue and it may not have been enough. With the retrosig approach where we're waxing the air cells, we didn't get enough wax in or in the translabyrinthine approach, what, will, what you have to do is take some fat from the abdomen and, and, and get it in there and you may not have had <clears throat> enough uh, fat in that area. So basically through the approach, you've created the connection between the um, uh, 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 ear canal <clears throat> and the, uh, the nose. Now, for, with the retro sig approach, the, the leak, if it occurs, can occur one of two directions. Through, through the internal auditory canal, there's a lot of air cells, or there wasn't a watertight dural closure. So what we do to avoid that is we, do, we put in a dural patch, and then we do what's called a Valsalva maneuver, which increases the brain pressure, and we can look and see if there's a leak. So we, we, we 
take a number of steps to avoid that potential problem. And then what you what you were referring to is the person that has fluid underneath their flap. That is because there wasn't a watertight dural closure <clears throat> and the fluid reaccumulates under there. That isn't necessarily a bad problem as long as it doesn't leak to the outside world. If it leaks to the outside world, either through the nose or out the incision, then that has to be surgically repaired. The approaches towards taking care of, the, of these leaks is first we put in, and if there's a direct leak from the incision, we would put a little stitch in it, but then we would immediately put in something called a spinal drain, where we try to divert the cerebral spinal fluid away and allow the wound time to heal up. If that doesn't work, then it's going to require re-exploration. And re-exploration would usually be either you know, through the original incision. If that doesn't work, <clears throat> we will come in through the nose and try to uh, plug up the eustachian tube with uh, artificial tissue. If that doesn't work, then we have to assume that the person has raised intracranial pressure and we have to discuss the option of placing a what's called a ventricular peritoneal shunt or a lumbar uh, shunt. Okay, okay. Uh, when, when you are talking about trying to make the decision between surgery and radiation, if there's brainstem compression, is that something where you direct a patient always one way or the other? Is that a definitive factor? No, it's not a definitive factor. It's again, you know, if it's a 75 year old patient with a little bit of brainstem compression, uh, uh, you, know, like you, you may want to watch it to see what the growth pattern is, because I want to make it perfectly clear. We say on average, they grow one to two millimeters per year, but they can lay quiescent for quite some time. And, but then the next time they could grow a centimeter. So, you know, we don't have as doctors and you as patients don't have control over that, but that's one option is to continue to, to, to follow it. You know, if there is brain stem compression, that's where the, the, the radiation oncologist and the radiation physicists try to, to <clears throat> conform their beams so that the brain, the, the brain is not hit by the radiation. And one of the ways to reduce the incidence of the radiation necrosis that I talked about earlier was by hypofractionating, doing the radiation doses in, in three to five separate treatments. So you're getting less radiation with each dose but the data would suggest that this hypofractionation, three to five doses, is equally as effective as single dose radiation for vestibular schwannomas. Great. Okay. And what happens to the tumor when you radiate it? It's it's it doesn't it's not removed like a surgical. So does it does it shrink? Does it just there 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 are, well there are three things that are going to happen. It can shrink. It may disappear if it's small. If it's usually intermediate or large size, it doesn't disappear, but it can shrink. Or it can stay the same size, which if the person is only complaining about some non-bothersome tinnitus and, and uh, their, their, their hearing is gone, then you know, no growth or stability of the tumor is, is perfectly fine. And then the third thing can happen is the tumor can continue to grow in which case we have to talk about retreatment. Okay. Um, and we have a couple of questions about the preservation of the facial nerve when you're doing surgery. You talked a lot about um, particularly that one patient that was looking to make sure that that facial nerve was preserved. How mm -hmm. did you do that? Is there um, something, are you monitoring it during surgery? Do you make it yeah. glow somehow? Yeah, intraoperatively, we put electrodes into the face and every time then you manipulate the seventh nerve, I have, there's two ways either you like to hear it and I like to hear it. All of a sudden you hear a bunch of going up on the monitor and it tells me, oh, you know, I don't want to go there. Uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, we've done one or two of these. So we kind of understand where the facial nerve should be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that can be particularly difficult. And, you know, sometimes patients get to me with, you know, six, seven, eight centimeter tumors. That's really a technical challenge trying to preserve the facial nerve. But the technical things that you do is you know anatomically where it should be oriented. As you're progressing with the tumor resection, you're continually stimulating with this little handheld stimulator. And then you have the monitor on. So in the background, you hear the nerve firing if you're starting to get closer 
manipulating it a little bit more than you should be. Okay. And I, you know, the, the other things that are different than say, you know, 20 years ago is the microscopes are significantly better. The micro instruments are significantly better. And the cabotrons, the things, the little ultrasonic devices that digest the tumor are imminently better or is significantly better. So, uh, you know, all of the technology that goes into the, the surgical resection of these has in my lifetime significantly improved. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, when you talked about the, the different hearing preservation strategies, I know with trans labyrinthine, the, the hearing is lost um, with that surgery. The other two though, how do you determine which one to use at which time? Is it surgeon preference or how does that work? Yeah, it's really surgeon's preference. You know, when I've, when I've gone over to France to operate, there's one surgeon that for any tumor, well, the tumor number one, has to be within the ear canal to use the middle fossa. Remember the third oh, case, okay. I showed, if the tumor extends into the cerebellopontine angle, the middle fossa approach isn't advantageous. Now, the beauty of the, and the other thing too, is the way, the way I like to think about it. If the tumor is on the left-hand side, that means I have to pull on the left temporal lobe. What does the left temporal lobe do? It's involved in memory and speech. So I like to be, you know, I don't necessarily want to be doing that. Right. Uh, the other thing anatomically when you're going through the middle fossa is the seventh nerve is laying on top of the tumor. It's between the seventh nerve is between you and the tumor. So you have to manipulate it a little bit more. Now that's not impossible to do, but you know, uh, I, we like to manipulate the seventh nerve as little as possible. So, uh, uh, for that reason, we would typically take a retrosigmoid approach just because we like to, we don't like to manipulate the seventh nerve as much. Right, which is the facial nerve. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you say you do hearing preservation, and this would apply to both surgery and radiation, is hearing preserved forever? With, with radiation, I mean, with radiation or surgery? But I would say if you could answer both, because yeah. I I mean, well, I mean, the data would suggest that over time with radiation, you are going to lose hearing. It's, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, so I, you know, I think that conversation has to be had. With hearing preservation, uh, uh, you, you, surgery, you're going to preserve the hearing. It, you know, if you lose it, it's, it's not going to get better after surgery. So the, the goal is hearing preservation and it's, you know, short of some other problem going on, i.e. the patient begins losing hearing for some other reason. As you well know, hearing loss is a common problem with aging. So sure. the, the hearing preservation is stable, yes. Okay. Um, and when you have patients, particularly younger patients, like the 20 year old, and you say that, you know, that's too young for radiation, what, what age do you feel like, where do you kind of draw that line? Oh, when, well, nobody's too young for radiation, but if I had a 20 year old that had a tumor within the ear canal, like that first case, where I thought with surgery, we could number one cure, and number two, an option of hearing preservation, I don't think that the right thing is to offer radiation, which you know has a 95% chance of, of cure, uh, but a very significant chance of hearing loss. Okay, so I, again, I think it's uh, uh, in medicine, we never say never, we never say always, and there isn't the ideal age group, okay? But, you know, uh, one common sense has to prevail here. What, what functions are you trying to preserve and what's the likelihood that you can preserve them, all right? And so in a, in a large tumor in a young patient, uh, the goal is to preserve function and debulk the tumor to the best of your ability. And once you've done that, <clears throat> you know, then, you, then you're faced with, okay, what are my alternatives in terms of adjuvant therapies? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not trying to dodge your question. <laughs> you know, the, there just isn't a good answer to right. it. No. I mean, normally around 60 years old, a person has a tumor that is either treat, treatable with radiation or with surgery, we would typically still recommend radiation, I mean, a surgery, but we certainly have to talk with them about the option of radiation. And you know, I try to 
uh, make it so understandable to the patient that they're comfortable making that decision for themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and we find that a lot with patients. They, they, you know, are in many cases able to, because of their circumstances, make that decision, but it's difficult. You know, they just yeah. giving them all that information is, is great. Well, the good news is it's a slow-growing tumor, so the decision doesn't need, me, need to be made that day. Right. Okay? And that's what people need to understand. Take a deep breath, go on home, talk with your family, come on back to the office, let's have another conversation, and really tailor the, 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 the intervention to meet your needs. Yep. That's a great, that's great advice. Um, for patients that are observing their tumors but are dealing with um, dizziness, and headaches, and then you mentioned tinnitus as well. And I and um, it was very interesting what you said about um, patients who do not have hearing, and the the whether or not the the tinnitus would resolve after yeah. removal. Um, but what do you what are, what would your recommendation be for for a patient dealing with dizziness? Maybe for a patient dealing with headaches, and then also with tinnitus. You know. Headaches is a little bit difficult. You know, I mean, if, if I definitely feel that the headache is related to pain back here and, and compression of the dura mater, the covering of the brain by the tumor, then obviously debulking the tumor with surgery is going to be the fastest way to get rid of the headache. Mm -hmm. In regard to tinnitus, as I said, if hearing is intact, you know, I tell patients that it's a 50-50 shot that we might get rid of the tinnitus if that's really disabling to them. Uh, uh, if hearing is gone, I increase that to 70 to 80 percent. All right. Radio surgery is not, you know, it's not effective for the treatment of tinnitus and certainly not going to be a quick answer to dizziness. If, you know, vertigo and dizziness is the symptom, this is a tumor of the vestibular nerve. So you go in and take that out. That's going to be the quickest solution for the patient. Okay. This is a question we get a lot. Uh, why, excuse me, why is um, acoustic neuroma called a brain tumor if it's not actually touching the brain, it's in the internal auditory canal? Number one, some of them do touch the brain. You know, right. you know, I showed pictures of that. Number two, the cranial nerves are considered part of the brain. This is a tumor of the cranial nerves and it's specifically a tumor of the vestibular component of the vestibular cochlear cranial nerve, the vestibular component being important for balance, the cochlear part being important for hearing. Hence, it's called a brain tumor. And of the patients that you have seen and, and spoken to, um, we get a lot of questions from patients about headaches and, and whether or not those are related to their acoustic neuroma, whether they're related to the treatment. Um, what has been your experience there? Well, I'm blessed uh, at here at Wild Cornell, we have some superb headache doctors, you know, and let's face it, uh, you know, taking a medicine is a heck of a lot easier than having surgery. Uh, and plus, you know, it, it's, it's of no advantage to the patient. And certainly it makes my life a little bit more miserable. If I go take the tumor out and the patient still has headaches, right. you know, and then, then they think I'm at fault. So I, I really like to, you know, get to the root of the headache. And again, as I said, if the headache is located in the region of the tumor, then I can, I, I feel relatively comfortable. But, it, you know, the patient has a left-sided left -sided vestibular schwannoma and they, you know, and, and they have a right-sided headache, it is extremely unlikely that the tumor is the cause of it. So then I would uh, send them to a headache specialist. In addition to that, does the patient have a history of migraine headache? Do they have a history of cluster headaches, tension headaches? You know, uh, are they doing things that exacerbate headaches? Drink too much coffee, eat too much chocolate. You know, uh, uh, you know and, and the one thing you didn't bring up is the post-operative headache. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, the the things that we do. I have to admit, I, I you know. I've had very few post-operative headaches. And what, so what do we do to avoid those? Uh, number one, I put the bone back in, and, but I use little titanium plates so that the muscle doesn't stick to the covering of the brain called the dura. And I, you know, I find that to be very important in terms of avoiding post-operative headaches. Sometimes, one to two times a year, I will have a patient come back that complains about the plate right underneath their skin 
you know, it's a day procedure. They come, by that time, the bone is healed. I, they come in, I take the plate out, and they go home the same day. Uh, and their headache goes away. Interesting. Okay. Um, for patients who are looking for a surgeon and looking for someone to treat their acoustic neuroma, what kind of questions should they be asking their surgeons to help them decide? Yeah. Well, I, you know, number one, I think, you know, the four questions that I started with is, you know, if, if, if the surgeon kind of dances around a lot of those things and dances around the, the statistics and Cites literature, but not personal experience. You know that that tends to be problematic. But I, you know, I think in this day and age, it's it's easy for a person to go online. You want to go to a major medical center where a person has done, uh, uh, you know, uh, an ample number of these. You know, you know I, I'm not saying that a person who does one of these a year is is a bad surgeon. I'm just saying that if you've done one or if you've done thirty, you know, it's uh, you. you all the data across all areas of surgery indicate that the more commonly you do something, the better results that you're going to have. And you know, I think another key component of this is when you're in the physician's office, you know, what's the team around him or her? You know, is a, you know, is there an NP? Is there a neuropsychologist? Is there this whole support staff? Because let's face it, you know, the next day the surgeon is in the operating room doing another case, you want to make sure you've got a team there that's going to help you manage your problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I find that exceedingly important in terms of patient satisfaction and just overall patient comfort. I agree. We, we encourage our patients to seek treatment from centers who have the, the wide variety of support and, and um, programs that are needed to help patients deal with what they have going on before and after treatment, and then also um, substantially experienced um, physicians in whatever treatment method they choose. So I think that's yeah. a great answer. And, and let's face it, I mean, you know, uh, some patients have incredible anxiety about what to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, anxiety is something that can be dealt with. So if I had a patient that has extreme anxiety, you know, I don't want them making a decision under that situation. So I get them hooked up with my neuropsychologist who assesses them and helps them through cognitive remediation or cognitive behavioral therapy, deal with their anxiety. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in medication for anxiety. I mean, I'd, I'd like the patient themselves to figure out how to deal with it. That's great. Um, what, why, there's a question about hearing loss and why it continues even after the tumor has been removed or after you've radi radiated it, why does the hearing loss, why does it, why is well, it? The nerve's gone, the nerve's dead. You know, you've either, you've either taken the nerve out with the surgical excision or you've, in the process of removing the tumor, which sometimes has shared blood supply with the nerve, you've lost one of the, you've either lost the nerve, or you've lost the blood supply, so the nerve doesn't work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing there to right. transmit the information from your eardrum to the brain. Okay. And you said that in your lifetime, the surgical tools and, and everything, the, things have changed so much since you've um, been doing this. Is there anything on the horizon as far as um, surgical or treatment options for a particular of patients? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think that our imaging technology is improving immeasurably so that and I, I uh, every year they're coming out with a, a better radio surgical device, you know, uh, that, you know, now they just came out with the zap device and, mm -hmm. and they have the, 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 the thing that I like the most is the one uh, where the MRI is giving you real time image. So if there's any motion in the patient, the device immediately corrects for, uh, corrects for the radiation dosage. You know, we're hopeful that over, you know, there's nothing imminently on the horizon about the molecular biology of these tumors, you know, so that we might give you some medication that makes them shrink. Um, uh, uh, from, a, from a surgical perspective, uh, you know, the, the image guidance that we use has been of great help. We're hopeful that with preoperative MRI, we might be better at identifying where the seventh and the eighth nerve are with preoperative imaging so mm -hmm. that 
you know, if we know where it is, then we can avoid it and, and, and uh, do a better job of getting the tumor out. Um, what about, what about fatigue? Is that associated with um, patients that you've seen? Have they dealt with that after surgery or radiation? Uh, not typically with, with radiation, you know, with, with, with fractionated stereotactic radiotherapy or radio surgery, it's not terribly fatiguing. Um, you know, immediately postoperatively, a patient that's had surgery is going to feel a little bit of fatigue from the anesthetic, from the medications, from the inflammation that goes on just from us being in there. But that shouldn't be a prolonged complaint. Uh, the one thing we didn't talk about is something called aseptic meningitis associated mm -hmm. with surgery. You know, there are patients can have prolonged headache and fatigue, and we treat those with steroids uh, for a couple of weeks, and eventually that goes away. Great. Well, at this point, we have answered all the questions that have come in from our patients. So I really appreciate your time. And um, I, the presentation that you gave was fantastic. And I think really helpful, helping patients sort of see some different scenarios and maybe different ways that they can think about things and that, that physicians think about things and how they determine, um, you know, how to proceed, because there are so many factors and so many different ways to think about it and uh and different things to think about that it it can become really overwhelming so i think that's i want to i want to compliment the people who ask the questions I and mean, the one thing that i find with the ana is um the is the quality of the questions i mean uh the patients have really thought about this which is you know not always typical for all patients of with with all types of neurosurgical problems so um and, and I'm sure that that reflects to a large extent the degree to which you participate in their education. So compliments to you and compliments to the people that they're really thinking about it. And I, you know, like I said, I, you know, you shouldn't feel badly about asking your doctor or your surgeon, you know, the hard questions. I mean, you know, you're about to embark upon something that's difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dr. Steve. We really appreciate um, your time and, and the presentation. We're very grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me. It was a great and pleasure. Thank you to everyone who attended today. We will go ahead and record the webinar. It'll be on the ANA website, which is, um, I put it in the comments, but it's www.anausa.org. We'll get that up there as soon as we can. And we'll also add um, captions to the recording. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Secretary.